or we call it sometimes, you know, OJK. Yeah. I would like to thank the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, for hosting the G20 site event together with OJK this afternoon. I treasure the collaboration and friendship we have built over these past years and look forward to another deepening collaboration, especially in the emerging issues such as green economy, financial inclusion, and also customer protection. For me, it is great joy to see you all in person here in Bali after a few years of lockdown. I finally can welcome you to this beautiful island, Bali. We call it also the island of God. Yeah. That Bali has so many unique culture and a precious value that inherited from the ancestor which is implemented by Balinese people from generation to generation. Yeah. As we build back together and stronger from the pandemic that has devastated impact to our economy and society, such as harmony and collaboration are more important than ever. And we can learn from the Balinese philosophy, which teach us to live in harmony with nature and other people, as they call it, Trihita Karana. The harmony among the el three elements, the divine, people, and nature, has to be maintained to achieve the prosperity of the Balinese people here. Yeah. The implementation of the philosophy can be seen in the harmony of life between Balinese people that follow Hindu Dharma and other religions such as Muslim, Christian, and also confusion. After all, Bali managed to preserve its original tradition for the thousand years and still celebrates its cultures in diversity until now. Yeah. Balinese tradition and culture are very interesting because they influence each other to produce a unique development of every kind of art in Bali such as music, drama, and dance, which are also part of religious ceremony in Bali. And then you can watch the dance performance here, Sedo Puppet, and drama, and also learn about stories that are interpreted by music, dance, and also custom. Bali is also home of the exotic ancient temple an iconic landscape with several of them being the island's most iconic landmarks. The temple will give you a different experience and give you a taste of island, fascinating religious belief and also dedication to the Hindu god. And also you cannot visit Bali without infamous rice paddies and also volcano which is by far the most splendid here in Bali. Excellencies, honorable guests and distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as in the Balinese life of philosophy, the implementation of the corporate governance needs a harmony between shareholders, board and committee, and also other stakeholders. The disharmony between them will lead to the week of the implementation of corporate governance, which contributed to the excessive and imprudent of risk-taking behavior in the financial sector especially, yeah. which led to the possible failure of individual institution, company, and of course, will lead to the systemic issues. After the pandemic of COVID-19, corporate governance practices have become even more important 
as financial institution need to adapt their business model in the fast changing environment, especially with the digitalization, strong competition, sustainable finance. Not only to raise the opportunity, but financial institutions also need to respond the new risk caused by technology development and also the climate change. As we are aware, recently, Basel Committee has released a consultative paper for principle for the effective management and supervision of climate-related financial risk and also propose prudential treatment of the crypto asset, which is in nature because of the digitalization and also because of the climate. Indeed, we must follow the same business, the same risk, and also the same rule principle to mitigate the risk caused by digitalization. The Corporate Governance Forum, we had this afternoon, mark an important step in the area of governance as it discussed in the incorporation of issues such as sustainability and digitalization into our revised G20 OECD principle. As an active member of the OECD Corporate Governance Committee, OJK, is also pleased to be part of this policy making process and hope that revised G20 OECD principle will be finalized soon. As the global economy gradually in the process of recovery from the pandemic, it is important that build back together and stronger. This means we need to ensure that scaring effect is minimized with the implementation of sound corporate governance, which can be essential in defining the role of the board and management within a business to ensure that all decision-making process are for the best interest of all stakeholders. Besides that, strengthening corporate governance also mean getting ready to develop a new source of economic growth to recover from the pandemic COVID-19 and also mitigate the emerging risk. As we have in the same goal to address climate challenges and build a more sustainable future, we must approach environmental, social, governance principle seriously as other business risks and opportunities to achieve sustainable growth going forward here. Yeah. As I mentioned before, the implementation of corporate governance is similar to the three Hita Karana principle, which also encompasses to the relationship between divine people and natures. Corporate governance reflected the commitment between person and person or person to the wider community or people and also reflected our commitment to achieve sustainable economic growth by addressing climate change and nature. We are aware that the financial landscape and risks we are facing recently are very dynamic and evolving. OJK is also aware that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to corporate governance, which means that this guideline will be a living document, possible to be revised going forward, depending the nature of our business. However, the establishing the fundamental are getting to the business ready to practice on corporate governance is very, very achievable objective. Yeah. As the regulator and supervisor of financial services in Indonesia, OJK is highly committed to providing a guideline or relevant 
directive to the strengthen corporate governance framework and standard. In line with the international standard, of course, yeah, including the G20 OECD principle. As an active member of the OECD Corporate Governance Committee, once again, I reiterate that Indonesia will be the role model in the implementation of the finalized G20 OECD standard. And we encourage the G20 member and also OECD member could be able to lead by example to implement the corporate governance principle. In closing, I would like to say that upbuilding a strong corporate governance ecosystem is most effective when there is a collective effort involving multiple stakeholders and the board of the company. Yeah. Thus, we have kind of your continuous support and partnership, especially the leader of the large company and also leader of international body to enhance the implementation of corporate governance principle. I am confident that we can achieve the desired outcome and goal if we work together. I hope this corporate governance forum will provide a clear and comprehensive input for improving the G20 OECD principle as well as maintaining the competitiveness and generating sustainable growth. Finally, I hope today's discussion will be fruitful and give a huge contribution to support corporate governance practice globally. And again, thank you, yeah, Ibu, Australia, Ibu Sri Mulyani, the uh, General Secretary from the OECD, you know, the, uh, uh, from Japanese uh, Minister yeah, for the joining this event yeah, and hopefully uh, going forward our collaboration will create you know, a global standard practice acceptable you know, in, in the world. Yeah. Thank you and have a great discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Bapak Wimbo, for the welcome remarks. Excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, in this opening ceremony, we are very honored to have the presence of the Minister of Finance of Republic of Indonesia. Please welcome Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati. Honorable Bapak Wimbo Santoso, the Chairman uh, of the Board of Commissioner, Financial Sector or Financial Service Authority or OJK Indonesia. My colleague, uh, Bapak Matthias Korman, the OECD Secretary General. Welcome, Bapak Matthias. My colleague, friends, uh, Mr. Sunichi Suzuki-san, the Minister of Finance uh, from Japan. Also my friends, uh, Mr. Masato Kanda, the Chair of the OECD Corporate Governance Committee, as well as Vice Chairman of Finance for International Affairs uh, Japan. Um, Bapak Eric Tohir, which is represented by Patito Tiko, uh, representing the Minister of State on Enterprises. Um, all dear colleagues, speakers, and honorable guests, moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya. Very good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to Bali. I would like first to express our gratitude for all of you who come to Bali, especially in person, physically, 
which is very very important for the people of Bali as well as uh, the economy of Bali which is hit hard by the pandemic in the past two years and also all the delegate who come to the G20 meeting as well as this occasion G20 OECD Corporate Governance Forum. I would like to thank the Secretariat of G20 Presidency, the OECD, as well as OJK, the Financial Service Authority, uh, who jointly with the Ministry of uh, State-Owned Enterprise to co-organize this very important forum. Welcome to Bali. And please don't stay in this very dark room. Outside there is a much pleasant green so please have your time a little bit to enjoy outside we are all aware that this COVID-19 is a game changer the crisis have revealed our weaknesses in corporate governance and also capital market including the rise of climate change and other environmental social and governance risk Along with the adaptation of the new normal condition due to the pandemic, economic activity and human mobility began to gradually recover. This need to be shared concern that amid the challenges of facing the threat of the COVID-19, which is not yet ended, the economy is slowly to recover and entering a recovery pace and hopefully also establishing a new normal. A sustainable economic development is therefore called for. One way to achieve this is to improve the very basic or the backbone of the corporation that is improving the corporate governance framework. The idea of sustainable economic development came into existence as a result of two important factors. The first is the irreversible degradation of economic resources and all kind which is caused by human activity. And the second one is the incompatibility of economic optimization standard with the existing dynamic of resources. Growth and equilibrium have always been trade-off in economic theory. Certainly, this is resonant well with the current situation in which many policymakers, especially on the finance economy, like Minister of Finance, Central Bank Governor, which is convened today in the G20 meetings, we are facing also with now very complex trade off between growth and stability. Growth, in this case, and equilibrium is a trade off. While selecting balance would guarantee economic growth, choosing expansion lead to system instabilities. So for all of, for all of us, the answer of this trade-off would be to choose sustainable development. Growth should not at the cost of sustainability or the other way around, sustainability concern should not at the cost of growth. Since 1987, when Brundtland report providing the idea of this sustainable development, this idea has evolved and has been used more and more frequently. The ability of current generation to meet their needs should not or without compromising the capacity of future generation to meet their own requirement, which is described in that report 
back in 1987. Seems like long, long time ago, but still resonated very, very strongly with today. In 1992, in Rio de Janeiro, Earth Summit, producing action plan which demonstrate how the corporate environment was perceived to be involved in safeguarding the condition that evolved as a result of this new paradigm. Following that summit, there was a period of time when businesses and environment began to interact differently. And it was during this time that the environment, environmental issue had to be internalized and made as a key component of corporate governance. In order to be able to generate long-term value, businesses need to be functioned in a complicated global context, also have to be continuously looking for competitive advantage. Despite the fact that the idea of corporate social responsibility or CSR has been there since the 18th centuries, it appears that its connection to sustainable development is more recent. CSR refers to voluntary commitment by businesses to satisfy the expectation of their employees, customers, and also the environment and local communities, as well as to support education and health targeting growth. They also lead to the long-term financial success and sustainable corporate development. The idea of corporate social responsibility and sustainable development seems to be no difference. The two ideas are applied to social and environmental problems. Companies that practice social responsibility business practice are very mindful of the needs and interests of all stakeholders in addition to their objective to maximize profit and gratifying shareholder. In addition, environment, social, and governance, ESG standard, which is mentioned earlier by Pa Wimbo, and socially responsible investment, socially responsible investment. The abbreviation, unfortunately, is SRI. It's my name, actually, SRI. Socially responsible investment, SRI our principle drawn from the CSR, and they appear to be relevant, similar at first glance. The ESG in this case represent the action performed in this regard and can be seen as a tool for identifying excellent management practices where the social responsible investment or SRI is investing method that reflect the value and belief that indicate the exclusion of financial asset in the portfolio based on ethical and moral standard. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let us look at the role of capital market in sustainability uh, development. Capital market is one of the component of the financial market beside the money market, the foreign exchange market, and the insurance market. I believe that many of us have understood the mechanism of the financial market and its vital role in allocating limited financial resources with a central problem of every economy. How? they can 
create an intermediary function in the most efficient way. It can intermediate the intermediate the savers and the investor, as well as channeling fund to firm that can use those resources productively. Capital markets are essential for financing the economy. The capital market enable the mobilization of funds from provider, that is household insurance, pension funds, to their client. The supplier are investors that want to invest their money as effectively as possible as they can as well as within the risk and potential reward that is already accepted. The contribution that effective capital market makers to generate economic growth has been the subject of protracted discussion among economists. Five functions of the capital market that promote economic growth, including facilitating liquidity, aiding risk reduction, monitoring managerial behavior, and processing information. This function of the capital market in promoting sustainability then can be linked to first, how the capital market could mobilize saving and raising capital and directing it toward project that is in line with the ESG principle. Second one, how capital market can altering corporate vision by incorporating ESG criteria within their best management practices, by limiting their access to finance for those which is violating the SG. And the third, capital market can influence good corporate governance practice that promote sustainable development through the ownership mechanism. But in reality, despite the fact that financial market has already adopting ESG factor into account, there does not appear to have been a dramatic movement in favor of enterprise that, has, that is more sustainable. So, in reality, this is still insignificant. And that's why this forum within the G20 meeting, we would like to continue promoting this movement and corporate governance, especially in order to encourage more ESG consistent investment. <coughs> For all of us, climate change which is already providing a systemic risk and also becoming more and more obvious, it can also threat the stability of financial system. So the task that need to be taken seriously by all stakeholders is how we are going to adopt comprehensive policy that we can use all the tool, both monetary and financial instrument, in order for us to be able to recognize and taking into account more explicitly the climate change risk within the decision of the investment, both for the investors as well as the owners of the money that is the saver. One of the most important instruments which is developed within this context is the global green bond. It's not only global, but also some countries already issuing within their own domestic market. And if it is Islamic based, we call it the green suku. Capital market in this case can become one of the most important institution to facilitate this kind of instrument, which is financing 
climate friendly project of course the integrity of this climate friendly project in terms of the verification as well as uh, transparency is going to be very critical government of indonesia indonesia is also among the government who actively issue or in this case designing the green bond as one of the instrument to achieve our sustainable goals including our commitment to the climate change the indonesian government since 2018 has issued 4.8 billion us dollar on the green bonds including in the form of sariah based or sukup we understand that issuing this kind of bond will require more compliance on the reporting as well as maintaining the standard of the green of the project which underlying this uh, issuance of the bonds so basically the cost it's much higher to comply but as i mentioned earlier the market has not efficiently and fairly putting the right price on this kind of instrument because the market doesn't differentiate between green and non-green bonds another thing that indonesia also trying to introduce within the capital market is issuing the sustainable development bonds uh, at the international market last uh, year 2021 we issue 500 million euro and this has become first nation in southeast asia with the lowest ever interest rate when you talk about lowest ever interest rate today this is becoming very very rare because the trend of the interest rate which is going to be increased will definitely change uh, the risk as well as the appetite ladies and gentlemen we fully understand that our work to promote as well as to adopt esg within the corporate governance has is it still far from done especially because our focus today is more on how we recover from pandemic how we have to deal with increasing risk coming from global global political tension which creating instability increasing supply disruption which then pressuring inflation very very high and that's in response is going to create a very tight monetary policy or policy framework that have that will potentially affect the risk appetite but we have to continue make our progress and our collective consciousness to continue also designing our recovery process as well as when we are dealing with current dynamic challenging tasks it doesn't have to be at the cost of potential climate change threat or sustainability concern i would like to express my highest appreciation for all organization who jointly today in hosting and organizing this event this is to show that even under a very difficult circumstances whether this is in the form of energy crisis whether this is in the form of food crisis or even geopolitical tension we should continue discuss as well as collaborate and cooperate to continue strengthen our partnership in and also to strengthen the cooperation of various stakeholder that can adopt and increasingly adopt and practicing the good corporate governance based on environmental social and good governance i wish you all to have a fruitful discussion and very productive one so that the result of this event can also provide a
positive contribution for this G20 meetings as well as beyond. Thank you again and don't forget to just step out and look at the sunshine so that we are all can enjoy Bali. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ibu Sri Mulyani, for the very fruitful remarks. With, uh, with all due respect, we understand Ibu will need to move to her next confirmed agenda. So Ibu Sri Mulyani, right after this, will need to leave the hall for the following agenda. Can we once again give a round of applause to Ibu Sri Mulyani? for providing the opening remarks in our opening ceremony. Excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, for the next opening remarks, kindly be invited Secretary General of OECD, Mr. Matthias Corman. Dear uh, Minister Sri Mulyani, Minister Suzuki, uh, Chair Santoso, uh, Chair Kanda, Ministers, distinguished guests, uh, friends all. A very warm thank you, first of all, to the Indonesian G20 Presidency and to the Indonesian Financial Services Authority for your leadership in hosting today's G20 OECD Corporate Governance Forum and in so strongly supporting the review of the G20 OECD corporate governance principles. Uh, today's event builds on our strong and long-standing G20 OECD cooperation on corporate governance. Good corporate governance is a key pillar of open market-based economies and a rules-based international order. It helps to build the necessary environment of trust based on transparency, accountability, and business integrity, which in turn helps foster long-term investment and financial stability. Good corporate governance is a central element then of our shared efforts to secure stronger, fairer, and more sustainable growth. The G20 OECD principles of corporate governance were first issued more than 20 years ago, back in 1999. The leaders' endorsement of those principles in Antalya, Turkey, back in 2015, was a significant milestone in our efforts to boost corporate governance standards globally. In fact, since then, 90% of G20 and OECD members have reformed their company or security laws or both to align them with the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance. As a result, these principles are now widely recognized as the leading global standard for corporate governance of listed companies and have also been embraced by the Financial Stability Board and the World Bank. As you know, they cover six main areas ensuring the basis for an effective corporate governance framework, the rights and equitable treatment of shareholders and key ownership functions, institutional investors, stock markets, and other intermediaries, the role of stakeholders in corporate governance, disclosure and transparency, and last but not least, the responsibilities of the board. The purpose of the review of these principles is to ensure they remain contemporary and fit for purpose, including by adapting relevant elements to the post-COVID-19 environment, taking into account structural effects of the crisis on capital markets and corporate governance practices. Indeed, corporate governance and capital markets have a key role to play in achieving broader economic and social objectives with respect to financial stability, investor confidence, capital formation, and capital allocation. So let me make a few observations. First, 
good corporate governance helps companies to access long-term financing. This is particularly important in today's global markets where international flows of capital enable companies to access financing from a much larger pool of investors. It promotes innovation, productivity, and entrepreneurship and fosters economic dynamism more, more broadly. Second, good corporate governance provides a framework to protect savers. Ordinary citizens are important investors in capital markets, providing a system for our citizens to share in corporate wealth creation while knowing their rights are protected gives them a more complete set of options for managing their savings and planning for their retirement. Third, good corporate governance supports the sustainability and resilience of corporations and as a result, the long-term sustainability and resilience of the economy. A sound framework determining the roles and responsibilities of shareholders, boards and stakeholders concerning sustainability matters is also important to help tackle long-term structural challenges like climate change. Indeed, the private sector has a key role to play when it comes to tackling climate change. Governments won't be able to tackle climate change on their own. Corporate governance frameworks then must be fit for purpose to meet our ambitious climate objectives and other environment, social and governance risks. So let me briefly touch on some of the weaknesses in corporate governance and capital markets that were exposed and exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one clear weakness has been the management of risks, including insufficient resilience of companies to unanticipated crises. The pandemic also shed light on major shifts in capital markets, including the declining number of listed companies and the lower number of innovative growth companies accessing our stock markets. Since 2005, over 30,000 companies have delisted from markets globally, which is ex equivalent to losing 75% of all listed companies today. This means fewer companies were able to access capital markets to help them navigate the crisis. Corporate governance frameworks must also account for changes in corporate ownership. Uh, this includes the dominance of company group structures, growing state ownership, and the reconcentration of ownership in the hands of large institutional investors. Today, the top 10 investors hold the majority of the capital in almost all listed companies around the world. These trends have important implications for corporate governance. For example, as the role of institutional investors in markets has grown, so has the call for them to become more engaged in the corporate governance of the companies they invest in. This has led to an increase in the development of stewardship codes globally aimed at encouraging investor engagement. Similarly, with the growth of large company groups, jurisdictions are increasingly focusing on regulation and disclosure requirements for complicated group structures to ensure that the rights of minority shareholders are appropriately protected. A growing number of investors now consider climate risks when making their investment and voting decisions. This includes the disclosure of climate-related information, the duties of boards, and the rights and incentives of shareholders. The OECD's report on climate change and corporate governance launched during our ministerial council meeting last month finds that climate change is already considered a financially material risk for listed companies representing two-thirds of global market capitalization. Sustainability disclosure will be essential for investors to better understand the risks they face and to efficiently allocate capital to the companies that may be better able to thrive in a low carbon environment. With shareholder accountability becoming a driving force for changing business practices, company boards clearly need to take account of the interests of all stakeholders. We will need consistent, comparable, and reliable disclosure standards 
on sustainability information. While this helps strengthen the balance sheets of viable corporations, it will also support the emergence of new and innovative businesses needed to support the green and digital transformations of our economies. Uh, in closing, I finish where I started. A good corporate governance is a key pillar of open market-based economies and rules-based international order. It will play a key role in supporting companies navigate the transition to a low-carbon economy, and I warmly welcome the progress made under Indonesia's G20 presidency, working together to update the principles for completion under India's G20 presidency next year. I look forward to continue our work together through this review to strengthen corporate governance and to strengthen corporate sector resilience and to help build a more su sustainable, resilient and inclusive future. And I thank you for the opportunity to say a few words and I wish you positive and productive deliberations today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corman, for the opening remarks. Now for the last opening remarks in this opening ceremony, we would like to invite Minister of Finance of Japan, Mr. Shunichi Suzuki. Mr. Minister Sri Muriani, Secretary General Coleman, distinguished participants, thank you for the opportunity to give opening remarks today at the Corporate Governance Forum co-hosted by the G20 Presidency and the OECD. I also appreciate the warm hospitality extended by the people of Indonesia. The economic and social environment surrounding companies is undergoing rapid changes, such as increased interest in climate change and sustainability, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the historic transformation of society due to digitalization. In this context, and under G20 leaders' instruction, the OECD Corporate Governance Committee is currently reviewing the G20 OECD principle of corporate governance, which form the single international standard endorsed by G20 leaders. The objective of the review is to dramatically improve this international standard for the policy makers, regulators, investors, and companies to adapt to such transformational changes and effectively respond to the associated new challenges and risks. The committee is chaired by Mr. Masato Kanda, Japan's Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs. As a member of both the G20 and OECD, Japan intends to make active contribution to the review. As we look back on the history of corporate governance reform in Japan, the reform started at about the same time as the previous revision process of the OECD principles. Namely, Japan's steward code and corporate governance code were developed in 2014 and 2015, respectively. They both aimed for sustainable growth of companies and enhancement of corporate value over the long term. 
Various corporate sector reforms have been advanced starting with these calls. Most recently, Japan's corporate governance code was revised in June last year. The revision was aimed at deepening corporate governance through dialogue between companies and investors. The three pillars of the revision were, first, strengthening the functioning of the board of directors, second, ensuring diversity in the core of a company's human resources, and third, enhancing sustainability disclosure. Furthermore, I believe that the viewpoint of the ongoing review of the G20 OECD principles have something in common with the new home of capitalism and economic policy advocated by Japan's current Kishida cabinet. The new form of capitalism is to upgrade a capitalist economy and make it stronger and more sustainable. We recognize that this is broadly in line with the motivations of the current review of the principles of corporate governance, which aims to enhance long-term corporate value by strengthening the sustainability and resilience of corporate activities. For example, one of the major pillars of the new form of capitalism is investment in human resources. Last month, the government released grand design and action plan for new form of capitalism. It calls for the disclosure of non-financial information such as policies for human resource development and working environment as well as indicators and targets to express these policies. The aim of the enhanced disclosure is to promote a change in the mindset of companies towards seeing their efforts on human capital as investment rather than expenses. This resonates with one of the objectives of the review of the G20 OECD principles that is taking into account the interest of a wide range of stakeholders, for example, by improving employee skills and the working environment, the disclosure will contribute to the country's better performance and success in the long run. Thus, the government of Japan will promote economic policies that are also in line with the G20 OECD principles. Next, I would like to mention the importance of Asia for the effectiveness, effectiveness of the G20 OECD principles. Reflecting strong economic performance in recent years, Asian capital markets have increased their presence around the world. According to an OECD analysis, more than half of all publicly traded companies in the world are listed on Asian stock exchanges as of the beginning of 2021. The market capitalization of these companies represents 32% of the market capitalization of all publicly traded companies worldwide. As we 
revise the G20 OECD principles, it is essential to sincerely listen to the opinions of companies, market participants, and authorities in Asian countries, which are the engine of global economic growth. Japan financially supports the outreach activity activities of the OECD, particularly in Asia. With significant input from stakeholders in Asia and other regions, we expect that the revised G20 OECD principle will contribute to further development of global capital markets and the establishment corporate governance frameworks. Finally, I hope that this forum will provide useful ideas and deep insight for the ongoing review of the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance and contribute to the development of a corporate governance framework that promotes sustainable and resilient corporate activities in countries around the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister Suzuki, for the remarks. Excellencies, so that was the opening ceremony of G20 OECD Corporate Governance Forum. And for now, we are going to continue with the update on the review of the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance. And to present this, kindly be invited to the stage Chair of OECD Corporate Governance Committee, Mr. Masato Kanda. Thank you very much. Distinguished colleagues, wonderful guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to join you today for this forum. I very much appreciate the Indonesian authorities and the OECD Secretariat for their great efforts to make this possible. And I'm particularly grateful to have this opportunity to inform you of the progress we are making in updating the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance. The review started in November 2021 following G20 leaders' support for the review at the Rome Summit in October. And our aim is to obtain the G20's endorsement of the revised G20 OECD principles next year. The review, start, uh, the review is managed by the OECD Corporate Governance Committee in which all OECD, all G20, and all SSP member participants and uh, today, I'd like to focus on three aspects. First, and very briefly, the role and uh, objectives of the Corporate Governance Committee. Second, the G20 OECD principles of the co Corporate Governance and how they contribute to share the strategic priorities of the OECD and the G20. And finally, main dish is the progress of the review of the principles to, to date. So, Yes, this slide gives you a brief overview of the Corporate Governance Committee. As this global standard set, as this uh, global standard setter in the field of corporate governance, its objective is to contribute to economic efficiency, sustainable growth, and financial stability by improving corporate governance policies and supporting good corporate practices. This covers both listed companies and state-owned enterprises which is particularly relevant for the final session of our forum today. I wish to underline here that all G20 and all FSP members participate actively, very actively in the committee and contribute 
as much as OECD members to our work. A priority of the committee is to ensure the widespread implementation of the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance, endorsement of the principles by G20 leaders in 2015 as the main international standard for corporate governance has significantly increased their global importance and influence. The role of the principles to help policymakers to evaluate and improve the legal, regulatory, and the institutional framework for corporate governance. As you can see in this slide, they have six, six pillars. The principles have been endorsed by the Financial Stability Board as one of its key standards, and they are used by the World Bank for national assessment as well. 53, 53 jurisdictions have adhered to the principles, including all G20 and all FSB members. The principles have three strategic objectives, which I will elaborate on further. To promote access to finance, innovation, and entrepreneurship, to provide a framework to protect savers, and to support the corporate sector sustainability and resilience. The principles provide a corporate governance framework that gives market participants the tools and incentives to ensure companies can access finance from capital markets. Capital markets play an essential role in mobilizing savings to finance large established companies and new and innovative firms. During the financial and COVID crisis, equity market provided companies with substantial and much needed capital. In 2020 and 2021, non-financial corporation raised record amount totaling almost two trillion US dollars in new capital. Capital markets have undergone important changes in most advanced markets. The number of listed companies has declined. The ex exception is in Asia, which now hosts half of all listed companies in, this, in the world and half of the most dynamic markets for initial public offerings. The principles focus on publicly traded companies and provide a framework to foster dynamic market and investment while protecting savers. With over 40,000 listed companies with a combined market value of 105 trillion US dollars, public equity markets are the largest assets available to households to participate in corporate wealth creation. Institutional investors are the largest owners and they invest a large share of their portfolios in foreign markets. This makes sound corporate governance policies essential to protect savers across borders. The principles also play a key role in supporting sustainability and resilience in the corporate sector. Climate change is a significant financial material risk for listed companies, representing two-thirds of global market capitalization. In addition, the corporate sector's indebtedness has increased significantly, doubling since 2005. A good corporate governance framework improves corporations' access to market-based financing, in particular public equity. Better access to equity means stronger corporate balance sheets. This enables new and innovative business to support the green and digital transition both essential for increasing long-term resilience. This slide highlights the 10 priority areas the committee has identified for the review. And these areas support a number of OEC and G20 strategic priorities, including promoting a resilient post-COVID recovery, managing the climate transition, and supporting the digital transformation. Last month, the committee concluded a first in-depth discussion of possible revisions to address all 10 of these priority areas. In my remaining remarks, I'd like to give you some of the key takeaways from these discussions. First, the draft proposes important revisions to the introductory framework to the principles, in particular to better reflect their three overarching objectives which I have just described. 
Both G20 and OECD countries have expressed strong support for this revised introduction and the overall direction of the uh, revisions. Important revisions are also proposed to the first chapter of the principles on the legal and institutional framework for corporate governance, which include revision to in encourage appropriate supervisory autonomy and capacity, a new recommendation supporting the use of digital technologies to strengthen supervision and enforcement of the corporate governance framework, and a new recommendation on the oversight of company groups. Other revisions are proposed to address the complexity of company group structures and over the disclosure of group structures and related party transaction. The biggest change proposed in the revision is a new chapter on sustainability and resilience. So we are introducing the new chapter focusing on sustainability and resilience. This is quite new. This, is, this chapter brings together guidance on corporate governance and sustainability issues from a cross-cutting perspective. And uh, it addresses the role, roles of corporate disclosures, both shareholders and stakeholders. Countries generally expressed support for the increased focus on sustainability, not only in the new chapter, but also with respect to revisions to existing recommendations in other chapters of the principles relevant for sustainability. These revisions notably address board duties, risk management, and the role of ESG assurance providers. The revisions also address the important role of institutional investors and stewardship, including the growing use of stewardship calls as a tool to support shareholder engagement and the need to address the increasing use of ESG indices, data, and rating by institutional investors and the they arise as indirect engagement tools for institutional investors. Another important topic for the review is the growing use of and related opportunities and risks of digital technologies. And the need to take account of these evolutions both in supervisory practices as well as the regulatory frameworks. New recommendations underline the importance of a technology neutral approach that doesn't impair innovation, while also promoting emerging good practices with respect to the conduct of the virtual and hybrid shareholder meetings. Concerning board responsibilities and duties, revisions include new recommendations on diversity and growing use of board committees. There is also a new emphasis on risk management, including crisis management, and a key new element of the principles guidance on executive remuneration addresses the disclosure of su sustainability indicators used in determining executive pay. Finally, the principles propose a new standalone recommendation to address the increasing importance of corporate debt and board bondholders in market, their rights and their impacts on corporate governance frameworks. Secretary General Coleman provided the second progress report of the revision to G20 Finance Ministerial meeting this week, outlining the progress achieved since his first report in February. I'd like to encourage you to consult this report for more information on the revisions under consideration. Public vis visibility of the review will further increase during the September and October when we will be holding consultations with a range of stakeholder organizations, policy committees, and the public. So public uh, consultation will begin in September. As noted, our aim is to present the revised principle of G20 OECD uh, uh, principles endorsement in 2023. Next year is the target. So distinguished Ladies and gentlemen, sound corporate governance and well-functioning capital markets will influence the strength and the quality of the recover from recovery from the COVID crisis and the resilience of the corporate sector to future shocks. More importantly, reinvigorate and innovate market economy for
for more sustainable and strong one. I therefore look forward to the discussion today to inform our work on revising the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance. I believe our partnership will continue to play an important role in achieving our shared objectives for years to come. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Masato Kandesan. Please remain on stage. Mr. Kandesan, please remain on stage because we would like to take this opportunity for a group photo with our dignitaries. So kindly join Mr. Kanda on the stage for a group photo. Bapak Wimbo Santoso, Bapak Kartika Wiryoatmojo, Bapak Mardiasmo, Mr. Yoshiki Takeuchi, Mr. Carmine, Carmine Dinoya, my apology for pronouncing your name not in the right way. Mr. Carmine Dinoya. So once again, we are taking this opportunity for the togetherness, the moment of togetherness in the event of G20 OECD Corporate Governance Forum. So the positions are right. Uh, Bapak Mardiasmo, kindly remove your uh, mask if you don't mind for this session. Okay, photographers all ready. On the count of three, please show your best smile. One, two, three. Can we give a round of applause for our gentlemen on stage for this moment of togetherness in this opening session of G20 OECD Corporate Governance Forum. And after